Hello and welcome to the special edition of the Daily Friend Show. My name is Amy Clay Morton and I work for the Institute of Race Relations and Campaigns. And Nicholas Lorimer has very graciously lent us his platform today so we can have a girls only edition of the show. And the reason we're doing this is because for the last couple of weeks, we've been raising awareness about the problems with the Firearms Control Amendment Bill, which proposes that firearms may not be licensed for self defense purposes. And we really wanted to discuss how this may or may not um, affect South African women. So I'm joined by a very special guest today, uh, Tsepi Mekwa, who is a media liaison for Girls on Fire, which is an NGO that focuses on um, training women in the use of firearms um, in order to combat violence against women in South Africa. Tsepi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and it is a real pleasure to have this discussion. Thank you so much. Um, let's start off with by uh, tell us a bit more about yourself and how you first of all got into guns, and secondly into Girls on Fire. Well, I am Tippi Megwa. I am from Pretoria, and I am a mother of two and a wife. So uh, I think it's. Uh, a question everybody has on their mind. How the hell did you get into guns? Well, uh, a good, very good friend of mine uh, back in 2012, 2013 actually invited me to a shoot and said, look, you don't have to like it. Just come on over. I think it's your thing, you know. Um, and I went there um, and one shot and the bug bit me and it bit me hard. <laughs> After that, uh, it was a sense of, I can do this myself, a sense of accomplishment. And there was a certain uh, uh, um, sense of strength that, you know, it feels like I'm in control of something about me as a woman pertaining to me as a woman. So that's how I got into it. And Girls on Fire, did that, um, how did that come about? Well, um, at that particular event, I actually met uh, Lynette um, and her husband, Paul. And um, I mean, we had conversations over the years and so on. And particularly in 2015, this idea was born after a statement was made that shooting is only for old white males. And uh, Lynette thought, uh, 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 there's so many women out there and said well would you like to get involved let's start this you know let's let's push it and let's get on with it and um we've been working hard at it um and creating campaigns for women run by women and it is been a real fun 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 thing to do uh more so because we deal with women you know um, and we do this for women. And the idea was women should not be victims any longer, which is, you know, unheard of in many circles because, well, women are supposed to be protected by men. No, women must protect themselves. You know, why must they wait for a male figure to do anything for them? And, um, I mean, the slogan for our campaign is basically, I'm every woman which is true, you know, whether you wear very long nails like I do and your yeah, hair and makeup all done. How does that affect um, loading a gun and firing with a gun? Very simple, very simple. Load it up, girl, load it up. You know how to do <laughs> nails and all. your long nails. And there are certain cheat factors that we can use, utilize like a Maglula, you know, you just easy, done, why, why must life be hard, you know, um, it's, it's fantastic, I mean, you can go to the shooting range and come out of there, put on some makeup and lipstick and nobody will be the wiser. And go to the next event. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do, you, do you as a mother, um, this is quite a personal question, but do you feel nervous about having your kids grow up against, around guns? And also, how do people in your life respond to you being in guns? Are you a bit of an unusual person in your friend circle? Or is it normal for you? Or, yeah. <laughs> well, first things first, um, for the awkwardness to be out of the way, especially for my kids, 
is to involve them in it. That's number one. Uh, once you teach a child about gun safety, all is everything is gained, nothing is lost. You know, my uh, soon to be 15 year old, she's been to the shooting range a couple of times now, and the bug bit literally before she could even think about it. And she said, I'm going back. So I've never been able to leave her behind. And she's gotten a lot of training in it and, and so on. Um, and um, a lot of the safety factors she's learned by being on the range and so on. So you can, I mean, there's certain aspects you can tell that she's she's actually been trained in a certain way because she's situationally aware of her surroundings um you know she does certain things she knows finger off the trigger unless you're ready to shoot there is certain practices she knows that for me what was important was making sure that should i be incapacitated that she has the means and the ability to utilize the very firearm that i own in yeah. order to, to defend the whole family you know um and in respect to the hubby <laughs> yeah, that's well, a little story behind that is that she, he's the first one to go in a restaurant. Where do you want to sit? Because <laughs> he knows I want to scout the door. I want to see what's happening out there. And I want to know where all the exits are, you know. Um, so very supportive. Um, he actually, he's not, he's not a gun person, but... Um, he'd much rather have me in control of it than anybody else. I mean, he always says, nobody's going to come after me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. nobody's going to come after little old me, but they're going to come after him, that's for sure. So who knows I've got his back. We say in, 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 in Bills on Fire, you know, hashtag, she's got my six. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit because I remember before we had this interview, we had a conversation once where... Um, I was discussing you you discussed situational awareness and i wanted to just quickly backtrack and go to that because i know that you guys focus on training quite a lot with your program so tell us a bit about situational awareness and that aspect of the training with girls on fire well first of all we teach women that um to be a vi in order for anybody to be in a situation of being a victim they are not aware of who's watching them Remember, criminals are always looking at the possible victim. And the possible victim is always the one who's unconscious about where they are. They know where they are, but they're just unconscious about their surroundings and could not be bothered for, you know, for anything. They're on the Facebook accounts while walking to a mall or sitting in the, in the car, the most dangerous place ever. Uh, on your cell phone and chatting and Facebooking and FaceTiming, everything that women do or putting on your makeup in the car and, you know, whatever women do, um, we are targets um, uh, for criminals and they are constantly watching us. So you have to be aware of your situation and that, that is the crux of our training. Be aware of the, your situations. Who's watching you? Because there's one thing about a criminal. When they know that you know they're not coming. Trust me, they are not coming. But when they know that you don't know, they're going to come after you. And they're going to come after your heart. They're going to come after everything you have. And in some cases, they take a woman, her bag, her car, and her. And they pluck her into the boot and go throw her somewhere else. So... It, it goes to the core of our training. Do not make yourself out to be a target. Be aware of your situation. If your gut feel says you're in the wrong place, back out as quickly as possible. I really love what you just said because I don't, I'm not very into guns, but almost all the things you've done, said, I've done it somewhere at the stage, like, you know, sat in the car unconsciously texting. <laughs> and I think it's quite a, profound insight to realize that it's not good to make yourself a target in that way. Um, I want to dive straight into quite a difficult question next, which is about gender-based violence. So obviously a huge problem in South Africa, very horrible. Um, but I guess there's two ways to phrase this question. First of all, what is the difference between 
a woman using her firearm in a situation of self-defense in her home against a known attacker versus her using it against a unknown attacker or a stranger in a public area. And I guess another way of asking that question is where and when is it appropriate to use your firearm, both legally and I mean, like, you know, safety wise? Well, there is no difference. Um, uh, truly speaking, I think the only difference goes to the fact that you either know this attacker because obviously they're in your home or you don't know this attacker. The, the, the thing about using the firearm is that you are guarding against being harmed, bodily harmed. So if it is your husband, your uncle, your brother who's doing this abuse, he's no different from the criminal who's jumping over your wall and trying to get into your home and rape you. He's absolutely no different. And the rule is that should an attack be on you, be imminent, life-threatening, you are, as a licensed firearm holder, in possession of a tool to use in order to stop the attack. So it makes no difference who they are. Um, we, we, we have a lot of women who come from a, abusive homes or who've been in abusive relationships and they've come through our training. And I, I remember one specific um, lady who's had a harrowing experience growing up. Um, she was um, raped. And then when she told the family about it, they tormented her further and an uncle raped her. It's a whole big story. And I remember she had one shot at a target and the she, she drew the weapon back closer to her and she said, I should have had this. I should have had this to defend myself, which changed Everybody, I think it brought a lot of women to tears because knowing her story, um, you know, it, it, it really doesn't make a difference of who the attacker is as long as they're trying to attack you. You have the right to defend yourself as a licensed firearm holder. And it is important that you know that you have the right to use that tool remember a firearm as we always say it's a tool it's not for everybody and we reiterate this over and over again women come through on our on our girls on fire events to see if this is for them it's not for everybody you know um remember that owning also a firearm and being licensed the the burden falls on you because now you have control over what happens right now does he live or does he die? You know, uh, which is an important it's a hell of a responsibility to. It's a hell of a responsibility to bear on yourself. But that's the thing about being a licensed firearm holder. You must know whether you can take on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot, then don't own a firearm. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you can, by all means, prevent that attack on yourself because we guard against bodily harm. Remember, it doesn't only also end at bodily harm. There is emotional uh, uh, um, after effects that come with that harm. You know, people are tormented for life um, uh, uh, with this and um, some never recover. So you preventing all of that and living with that harrowing experience by just defending your life. And that's what we promote. Mm. It's 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 definitely a, a tough one, um, because obviously it wouldn't be what one would want the first resort to be. But I remember having a conversation with us about somebody else. Uh, oh, sorry, with somebody else, and um, I remember the conversation going, "Do you value your life less than you value your attacker's life?" Firstly, and secondly. If somebody does a terrible thing to one woman, they're probably going to go and do it to another woman. But it is, it's a, it's a tricky one. It's not an easy one on that. Have, have you ever had to use your rifle for, um, well, your firearm for self-defense? Um, and if, if yes, what was that like? Fortunately, I have not. 
And I don't think I'm the personality you actually want to get into that situation with because even without a firearm, I will fight tooth and nail and you will get out with nothing. Um, but no, unfortunately, I have a fighting spirit and I've never actually had to use my firearm. I am, I am surrounded by people who've um, had to try and defend their lives and not necessarily with a firearm but with a knife and, uh, um, and and so on. So those are harrowing experience that you get to learn about and be faced with people who've been in those situations. And you ask yourself, do I want to be in that situation where I'm begging for my husband not to come through the door? Do I want to be in that situation where, you know, I can see an attacker coming through my door and hacking my door down? And I've got no way to go or nothing to use to fight that attack. I don't want to be in that situation. But believe you me, if I am in that situation, I would I would use my I would use my tool. I would use my tool guaranteed. Um, what is the process of getting licensed with a firearm like? What is that like? Oh my goodness. So it is a long and arduous process. So first of all, you have to understand the theory around it, the legalities around it, and you have to study on it. You have to write an exam. You have to, and in that exam, you're describing even your firearm. You have to know every part of the firearm. It's the tang, it is the slide, it is, you know, you have to actually describe every one of them. And that also depends on where, what section you're doing. So if you're doing a self-defense only, which is a section 13, uh, which is exactly what the, the amendment bill is trying to get rid of, um, you're basically just describing your hand handgun. Now, if you go into your section 16, then it is a self-loading rifle, it is a shotgun, it is a handgun. It's all this that you have to learn, the legalities around it. You have to learn how to describe the firearms and um, everything about it. So I think for me, that's the easiest part. The most difficult part comes when you have written all the exams, you've been to the range, you've shot the firearms, and you've been on target and so on, and it goes through the SAPS process. That's when it takes forever. So to give you a typical example, yes. So to, to give you just a simple example, I did my section 16 in two weeks. So that's doing open book test and doing the close book, book test and being on the range. Two weeks, study, flat out, done, dusted. Then the long way to freedom comes when it goes to SAPS. It is literally supposed to be 90 days. It is not. It is currently, I'm told, is running at about 150 or odd days that you're waiting for your competency to come out. This is not your license yet. This is just your competency. And then after you get approved for your competency, then you have to go through the licensing process. And uh, through that licensing process, it can take another six months. They don't care, SAPS doesn't care. And the problem is that there is so much red tape and paperwork behind it. When you get, comp when you get competent, you are then criminally checked so against the system. So your ID and fingerprints and others will tell a story to SAPS. Honestly, that should not take that long, but granted it does. And then when the licensing pro process comes, so the licensing process is when we take the firearm and we say, this is my firearm, I've bought this one, this is serial number, this, 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 this is the make of the firearm and, and, and. Then they go back and they do another criminal check. They've just done one. Now they're doing another one. So there lies in the backlog of this whole process. 
And Why can't is... they do a second criminal check, though? Um... There is no reason. Absolutely, absolutely, there's no reason why they would do a second one. I mean, you've just been certified as yeah. property, and you're putting in for just the card. This is the card that you're trying to put in for. So now they're going to go through the whole process of seeing if you are criminally involved in anything, right? They've just checked. And this is the problem we have with SAPs as a whole and this amendment to this bill. They are the worst administrators at this. And as Girls on Fire and Gun Owners South Africa, we would rather move the administration of this process to another entity other than SAPs, because we know they're terrible at administration. It can go to SARS for all we care, because SARS is meticulous. I mean, they will hound you for a cent that you owe them. You know what I mean? But we want it properly controlled and efficient all at the same time. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And quickly gone through the process because SARS is efficient. How at this point, home affairs is more efficient than SAPS. <laughs> Well, and that's if you the don't truth. do that process, you have to really, really want to be licensed because it sounds so rigorous and thorough. Um, and cost-wise, what are you looking at in terms of cost of getting licensed in a gun as well? Well, it goes from dealership to dealership and how they've structured it. Um, I'll give you just one example of uh, Tech Shack. Um, so Tech Shack will, will, will get you competent in all four uh, levels of firearm for about two and a half thousand rand. And um, and then basically it's the paperwork at SAPS, which is nothing to mention about, basically nothing to write home about. And it's just basically for them to do admin. That's what you paid for. And then obviously then purchasing your firearm and depending what kind of firearm you want and so on, it would then, and where you purchase it, then the cost obviously would differ. So for a typical handheld um, a firearm, then you would looking at about 8,000 to 12,000 or so. This is now for a decent Glock 19 type of firearm, nothing you know, nothing fancy or whatever. Um, so, like, mine is around the region of 11,000 or so. And I and mine is a Beretta. It's Italian-made. Trust me to go with the... the <laughs> Rather than the Italian shoes, you got the Italian gun. I'll take Precisely. Italian food. <laughs> <laughs> and I do like Italian foods. <laughs> so... Um, I, and I mean, I just, I, I just love it. Um, I think that most people will go for a clock because it's just readily available parts, availability, I don't and all of that. No, any of these guns. So to me, this is still a little bit Greek. Like, I think, I I'm wondering think the which is the small one and which is the bigger one. <laughs> Look, and this is the part of our training as girls on fire we actually introduce women to the different ranges of firearm. And I think the perception in most minds is that, oh, I just need a small little one and I can point it and shoot. No, no. The smaller ones tend to bite. They bite back. You will pull the trigger and you feel like, oh, ain't I? Like, excuse me, you know, um, you need to be able to handle that baby. So you find that after our trainings, most women will be like, I don't like that little one. She's a bit of a naughty, naughty. <laughs> um, so I prefer my Beretta. I, um, it's an APX, Beretta APX. Um, she handles like a dream. Um, I don't have jams with her and, and, and all of that. So most uh People carry a Glock um, because of pass availability and everything else. And um, look, Glocks are nice. Um, they're made out of plastic, but they're nice, you know. I call them the Tupperware. 
So, <laughs> you know, uh, they can carry their Tupperware. I'm going to go with a, I'm going to go with a. Something more hardcore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You carry your gun with you. I don't know if this is a question I should maybe not ask, maybe a bit too personal, but um, do you have your gun with you often or you know, do you take it with you everywhere you go is what I'm trying to ask, but I don't know if that's like in the lights. I think most women in the gun community will tell you they sleep with them very close by. <laughs> I think it is one of those um, going out and you don't have a bra on, kind of like feels everybody's watching. Mm, no, I think I'll put on a bra, you know, even when you're not comfortable wearing one, you just, well, I will put on one, you know, so, um, yes, um, do you carry it everywhere kind of situation, um, nobody needs to know that it's there, really nobody. <laughs> Unless you get asked it in an interview and then it cuts out of the pack. <laughs> I've got a question relating to what our police minister said a few days ago that I really, really want to ask you. Um, so police minister Becky Sele said um, recently that the mere possession of a firearm can lead to increased rates of victimization, both for the gun owner and those living in the household. And he also added, simply put, this proposed change in law also has the potential to mean the difference between life and death for hundreds of women who are in the clutches of their abusers inside their homes. What would you say to that? First of all, Becky Taylor doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to be upfront and very bold in saying that. Women are being slaughtered in South Africa day in and day out at the hands of the abusers without firearms. And let it be on record that there are many policemen who attack their own wives and children in their home. And even when it is reported, their own superiors don't take those firearms away from them. So that's point number one. Beggy Taylor doesn't understand that a woman who is 68 kilograms, 70, whatever, has got no physical chance against a male who is 100 kilos or over physically. I mean, you and I don't have a chance to push away an attacker and actually win a fight, a hand fight. So, no. Beggy Tele is wrong in all those aspects. He is, at this point, turning women into victims. He is, he, you know, this bull basically seeks to make more women victims than anything else. If you take away my right to defend myself, what are you hoping? We know that there is one policeman for 411 people. One policeman for 411 people. When you are being attacked, what is the likelihood that you're gonna get police protection right then and then? There is one guarantee when an attack happens. There's two guarantees actually, that you will be there and your attacker will be there. The police are there to take stats, nothing else. They take a rape kit and they still botch that up. So Betty Tele has absolutely no right to be talking for women without involving women in this discussion. He needs to stay out of it. He needs to ask women who have been in these situations, what should happen? You leave us toothless, you leave us defenseless, and you, you turn us into victims. 
And as girls on fire, we say we are victims no longer. We, we want to level the playing field. And with a firearm, it is a good chance. I, I guess you've actually kind of answered my second last question, which was how does this, um, how would this amendment um, affect you, not only as a gun, wo uh, gun owner, but as a South African woman? Precisely that. Um, you're going to leave me defenseless. You're going to leave me open to attacks. You're going to leave me to be slaughtered in the streets of South Africa without a tool to use in my defense. Um, and in the same breath, you know, it's ironic because he went into parliament and cut visible policing. No, the we all bodyguards. <laughs> and then he increases VIP protection. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? So the protected shall remain protected and will remain even more protected. Well, we, the most vulnerable citizens of this country, continue to get slaughtered in the streets of South Africa. And we have one policeman who's probably been called out to four other, 400 other cases. At that point, to attend to me. What are you saying about me? Do you not care? You know, are you not enabling this situation to get to get even worse? Why why the hunger for control by the government? Why? We have to ask that question. Why do you need to 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 turn away from from uh, uh, guarding against bodily harm? and to state control. It, it's a question that is on everybody's mind. Why would you need to do that? What is coming beyond that? So it, it raises questions about, are we in for a bigger fight than this? And this is just the beginning or what is going on? Uh, that is a question I hope all South Africans will ask because one of the things that we've raised in our arguments is that there's a lot of illegally owned firearms and there's a lot of police firearms that are not accounted for. So it doesn't really make sense to go after legal gun owners who, as you explained, go through this incredibly rigorous process to just be allowed to have a firearm. Um, my final question for you is um, going to be related to what you're doing now, because Tepi is actually joining us from Cape Town, and she's had a very busy day um, in Parliament, I believe. So tell us a bit about that and what's next for Tepi and for Girls on Fire. Well, with Ghost and Girls on Fire, what what is happening because of this um, amendment to this whole bill? Um, you know, there's also there's different organizations basically just coming together, um, raising their hands and saying, wait a minute, we are totally opposed to this. And everybody has their own angles. And obviously, as um, an organization that uh, defends the rights of people who own firearms and so on, we are going to come together with other organizations in order to become a more for formidable force. If anything, this amendment, this proposed amendment to this bill, what it's done is that it's actually brought every everybody from all walks of life together rather than screaming apart. Um, I think um, you would have known as well, it's been difficult to just get a hold of me at the best of times because one minute you are with the da you are with the freedom front plus you're with ewn you're with everybody who is just you know enc it doesn't matter who as long as the discussion is about the amendment to this bill we are pushing and pulling together in order to ensure that our rights to life are not being uh, uh, compromised. And um, I mean, we've met with the city of Cape Town today um, and, you know, we've gone through um, the program as well um, as, as an invitation. And um, we're doing everything. We're doing everything to defend the rights of firearm 
um, ownership in, in the country. And um, I think most importantly, the right to life. Because, it, you know, as much as they can say that, oh, but um, you don't have an inherent right to own a firearm, uh, what is enshrined in the Constitution is my right to life. And um, actually, it's my right to own a firearm in order to defend my life. And that's just the bottom line. So we are, I think um, you'll see us traveling far and wide um, to any organization that needs us and to be having this conversation like yourselves. Um, and we will give ourselves and we will do our bit to fight for everybody's right. Um, this is not just for gun owners. It's for people who don't even possess a firearm yet or even licensed in one or competent in one. And I mean, we've had very a lot of calls from people who said, wait a minute, uh, if I'm just, is this what the government is trying to do? And when we say, yes, they say, no, now I want to be licensed. It doesn't, it doesn't fit well with the idea of liberty. Um, I think that's one of the issues that we're kind of up against is it's a yeah. centralization of con power. Um, so it does ring quite a few warning bells for people. Yes, yes. And this goes, and as I say, it's, it goes for not only licensed firearm holders, it goes for everybody. Mm -hmm. This is this is the right, this is your right to choose whether you want to own one or not. And whether you want to use it as a tool to defend your life. And they're trying to take that away from you as a person. Do you really want them to do that? Do you really want them to have control when they went into parliament and admitted that their mandate is too far stretched and they cannot fulfill it. I mean, if a mechanic says, I cannot work on a computer box and therefore I cannot fix your car, are you going to return your car to the same mechanic? <laughs> Point taken, <laughs> yeah. You know? So it's it's concerning everybody. Um, and this is the time where we're actually asking people to um, fight back. Fight back. This is not the time where you're going to sit behind Facebook and Twitter and tweet, 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 tweet. No. Get on uh, Dear South Africa. Go to those links. Oh, we have a petition too. You can yes. Petition. Uh, precisely. Um, sign up, but let your name and voice be heard. That is the important part. This is not the time for people to be pulling backwards and just complaining and whining about, oh, this is not a, this is just not a service delivery moan about session. You know what I mean? This is the time to say, the buck stops here. And I'm going to stand behind these organizations that are actually fighting for me to be secured in my, in my own home. Remember, this doesn't affect people, as I said, with just Section 13. It affects the whole grouping, whether it's collectors, Section 16 holders, you know. It, it affects everybody. This is the security industry. I wanted to ask, does it affect security guards? Because my big thing about guns is I don't own a gun. I don't really intend to, but I have to admit that living in a house with um, private security that protects me, I'm protected by guns. Um, and I wasn't sure, does this actually affect security guards? Because I wasn't so clear on that. I was clear on the self-defense amendment, but the rest was a little bit difficult for me to grasp. So does this affect um, security guards and security private security companies? Yes, unfortunately it does. Um, this would mean that basically all your um, security, your ADTs and so on, are going to not have their firearms to protect you. So not only are we talking jobs, we're talking about the ability to um, protect you as an individual. Now, are you expecting private security to pitch up there with a feather and say, shoo, shoo, shoo? Uh, honestly, honestly, it affects us all, every one of us. So we have to take cognizance of the fact that this is this is control over citizens and we're not going to have it.
we're really not going to have it. Well, thank you so much, Sefi. And she really does work that hard because the whole of today, Sefi has been in meetings and I know because we're now at evening recording this interview. So your dedication is incredible. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you also to our audience for joining us. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or evening whenever you're watching this. And please feel free to leave your comments in the comment section below. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Cheers.